Forwards, back. Are you, are you all right with that? If we change the size then, David? Yeah. Forward, back. Yeah, I'm going to stand here and then you... Okay. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to this um, extended uh, diabetes department uh, meeting. I'm told this is being recorded, so some of us need to behave ourselves without mentioning names. Um, on behalf of the diabetes department, we, uh, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, David Unwin and Simon Tobin. M many of you would have heard of the names or seen them on television. Um, both are GPs at Northwood uh, Surgery in Southport, uh, but have done um, extensive work on the low carb program, as well as um, uh, the park run concept, uh, and have collected many awards uh, along the way. So, thank you. Off to you. Just checking, can you hear me properly? Great. So, uh, yes, so I'm D David Unwin. I'm obviously an old GP, and uh, I'm going to tell you, we're going to tell you together a, a story um, uh, about how uh, we went from really not being at all interested in diabetes. So if I tell you that six years ago, uh, people with type 2 diabetes were my least favorite patients, the least favorite. And type 2 diabetes and obesity were even lower down than that. I hadn't any interest in them as a group of patients at all. And the story we're going to tell you is how how I've gone from them being the least favorite patients, they are now absolutely my favorite patients. I, I'm excited uh, by somebody with type 2 diabetes. I see potential and I get results on a daily basis. Every day I'm seeing people now who say thank you and have changed their lives. I never thought I'd see that. I had no expectation uh, that this would happen. So that's the... Um, the beginning of the story would be uh, years ago. I've got a couple of uh, disclosures there. So you can see what we've done has been entirely self-funded. So we've been doing this low carb thing, I think it's five years now. We had a single grant of 7,000 pounds from the CCG at the beginning. And since then, we funded it ourselves, all of it. And that's because we, uh, we believe in it. Um, we don't get money from it, we're not paid in anything, in any way. Any money we ever get, we always donate to charity. And now to Simon. Okay, um, hi, th thank you. Um, so I'm Simon Tobin, I'm a GP in Southport, have been for 25 years. Um, I have no conflicts of interest to declare. I work for Parkrun as a national health and wellbeing um, ambassador, but I get, I get no money at all for that. So this, this first slide is to remind me about what I call the wilderness years. And I think of the wilderness years as the first 20 years of my diabetic practice. Fairly depressing, demoralizing place. I know you all have been there, done it, got the t-shirt, so I, I'm hoping this will have some resonance with you. But a fairly typical experience for me would be a type two diabetic, newly diagnosed, coming to see me in clinic. And we talk about lifestyle, particularly diet, we talk about sugar and we talk about reducing the sugar, the refined sugar and a low fat diet. We'd follow the kind of eat well plate guidelines. We check an HbA1c a few weeks later or you know, a few months later. Control would usually have improved and we'd tick along for a bit. But over a period of months, maybe years, the HbA1c would begin to climb. Control would begin to get a bit worse. And I'd say, well, what are you doing differently with your diet? And they'd say, nothing. I'm, I'm, I am cutting out the sugar. I am eating a low-fat diet. I'm eating some starchy carbs with each meal. And I used to say, well, that is actually type 2 diabetes. It gets worse. It's a progressive condition. It's out of your control. And so eventually, we'd have to have a, con a, a conversation about medication. And as you guys all know, we'd usually start off with something like metformin. Now, in the literature, metformin causes side effects in around 25-26% of cases. GI side effects, abdominal bloating, wind, diarrhea, nausea. In my clinical practice, I, I think it's probably double that. If you actually ask people, metformin works by putting people off for eating because they feel unwell. So I'm not a huge fan of metformin. But eventually the same thing would happen again. We'd start metformin, we'd crank the dose up, 
as the HbA1c inevitably began to climb again and control began to get worse. Despite the reassurances that no, 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 they were following the diet, but diabetes is a progressive condition. It gets worse. That's what you have to expect. After a while, we'd need a second-line drug, sulfonylurea. We'd usually be thinking about glyclozide, where, where we are anyway. Glyclozide took me a while to work out, causes weight gain, half a stone to a stone in everybody that takes it. Nobody likes that. Clearly, there's a risk of hypos as well, which you guys are all aware of. Once again, with the glyclozide, we go through the, the same scenario, um, increasing the dose, risking more and more side effects, until we started thinking and having a discussion about third-line oral medication or insulin. And that was all fairly depressing, really, to preside over a descent into, into disease, into illness, to ratchet up medications with increasing side effects. And, and it was quite a, 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 just a, a depressing place to be as a GP watching that happen. But then for me, those 20 wilderness years ended about five years ago. And I'll hand over to David. So yes, um, what happened to me five years ago was a, um, a particular patient came in. I was very annoyed with this patient because she was extremely naughty. She hadn't been taking her metformin for months. And I had an idea she was going to ruin our quaff figures and we'd be poor. And nobody likes a poor GP. So I called her in, uh, wrote to her and said I had concerns about her care. Would she come, and, uh, come in? And I, sh I shouted for her to come in and the wrong the wrong patient came in. It was clearly not Mrs. Jones because I didn't recognize the woman. She'd lost so much weight. I actually tried to send her out of my consulting room saying, sorry, it's Mrs. Jones. And she's saying, Dr. Omin, I've known you for 10 years. I am Mrs. Jones. She'd lost so much weight. More than that, um, when we did the blood tests, she'd actually put her diabetes into remission. And I had never seen that in 25 years. I was fascinated. How had, she, how had she done this? And she'd also put her husband's diabetes into remission as well. His hemoglobin A1C was also normal when I checked it. So I was fascinated. And it turned out that she was part of um, a sort of underground organization, the low carb movement, a sort of secret organization. And uh, she was on a forum, and at that point, I can't remember now, I think there were 40,000 people with type 2 diabetes helping each other on a low-carb forum. I was amazed. I had no idea. I was absolutely amazed. And um, so, reading into it, I thought maybe they've obviously got something, because there are all, all these stories about how well they were doing. So I thought, I'll, I'll join the forum and try and learn some more. Uh, but they, I, they were so suspicious of healthcare professionals. They'd never had a doctor or a healthcare professional who had treated them properly. They'd always been rubbished, their results rubbished. And after 12 hours, I was removed as a troll from the website. And then investigated, actually investigated. They sent. Uh, the CEO of the organization to the Norwood Avenue practice in Southport to investigate me because they were sure I was going to rubbish them. That's the level of trust they had for uh, healthcare professionals. And that was the beginning of my, the beginning of, of hope for me, uh, the beginning of my story. And if we look now, just looking at this slide, um, so there is now a huge low carb movement. So if you go on Amazon, and just look at low-carb books, which we've done there. There are 18,657 books on low-carb alone. So something huge, something huge is happening. Tom Kerridge, the dopamine diet, that was number one for a long time. If you look on at diabetes.co.uk, they have a low-carb program. Over a quarter of a million people have done that low-carb program. If you then look at um, the, um, this is the work down here of Einfeldt, a GP in Sweden, he runs their website. Another quarter of a million people with type two diabetes have been investigating it on his site. So that's half a million people I know of 
and there are many, many more. And most of us now, clinicians, have come across somebody that's gone low carb. It's really, um, it's really growing. So that's kind of, first of all, I met a patient. She really got my interest. I was so fascinated and humbled, particularly when she said, you're going to be cross with me, Dr. Amin. I don't want to tell you. How could she, you know, she should have been proud of her achievement. She shouldn't have been in fear. I shouldn't have written her a letter telling her off as I did. So I was a bit late waking, waking up, really. But that woman, I'm so grateful to her. She's taught me such a lot. Next slide. So now we're cutting uh, to what's going on now. So uh, slide on the left. What you're actually seeing there, this is hemoglobin A1C over time you're actually seeing diabetes put into remission. So that's somebody who came to see me with a hemoglobin A1C in millimoles per mole of, that was about 56. And within 38 days, it had come down to below 40 in 38 days. Now that was just, um, that was about a year ago, and the patient, as you see, has continued in remission. How much different his journey would have been with me six years ago? Because here we would have started metformin, and then we'd go back to the progressive deteriorating condition. So the longest patient I've had in remission now is five years, and he's still completely fine. And we are seeing people now with type 2 diabetes in remission, not using drugs, every week, every week we're seeing them. Just for interest, if we look across at this same uh, guy, look at that waist circumference. So when he first came, he had a waist circumference of 107 centimeters, and within 38 days, it was down to 92. This guy is wearing jeans, he's showing off, he's amazed. Uh, I mean, it's like, it really is like low carb liposuction. We see it often, I'm collecting all the data, they lose abdominal fat and very fast. A little aside, really, I used to, um, I didn't really bother with hemoglobin A1C. I would leave it for about six months. I was leaving it far too long, far too long. There's a paper down there um, pointing out that you get 50% of your, the change towards uh, your treatment goal in the first 30 days. And feedback for patients is so encouraging so it's really worth doing those blood tests early because the results often surprise you. Uh, this one is unusual, but I'm often delighted in a month, and the patient then knows they're doing the right thing. Really, really interesting. Um, can, can I just share, are you, in terms of units for HbA1c, do you use millimoles per mole here, or are you on, still on percentages, or? Go, okay, fine, okay, okay. So uh, D David came to me after a while saying that he'd, he'd met this interesting woman and he'd be begun experimenting with a number of his diabetic patients with, a, with a, taking a low-carb approach to their diet. And it made me think, well, should I be doing this? Is this something that makes, makes sense, really? So I thought back to my undergraduate biochemistry and I thought about starch. And when we talk about starch, the, the carbohydrate in potatoes, in rice, in bread, in pasta, in grains, rather, as opposed to refined sugar. And starch, as you can see, is just a string of sugar molecules, glucose molecules, joined end to end. It's very rapidly broken down and absorbed as glucose. So that made sense. It, it, it seemed a bit bonkers when I thought about it, about why were we recommending starchy carbs with each meal to diabetics? when it's broken down into sugar and we know that we're recommending that they don't have sugar it, it, it just didn't make sense but I was told by people who taught me diabetes oh the medications need something to work on your insulin your glycoside must have something to work on that's why you need the starchy carbs so I wondered well what did august bodies have to say about taking a low carb approach well nice updated its guidance um, last year and it says encourage high fiber low glycemic index sources of carbohydrate in the diet so we're good with nice 
What about the Cochrane Collaboration? Highly respected independent review body. If you just look at the bottom, the conclusion, a low GI diet can improve glycemic control in diabetes without compromising hypoglycemic events, i.e. a low carb approach is okay and it doesn't give you hypos. So more endorsement from, from Cochrane. Most recently, most pleasingly, the sign um, guidance, the Scottish Intercollegiate Network, if you look at point four, restricting the total amount of dietary carbohydrate is one of the options that they suggest. To, they say a minimum of 50 grams per day. That's substantially lower than many low carb diets. So that's quite pleasing to see that there's support out there um, for a low carbohydrate approach. So I want to introduce you to Mary, a patient of mine. She has, and all the patients that we're going to share with you, they've given their consent to share their data and their images um, with you. So I'm really fond of Mary. She's 85. I've known her for 25 years. And she's had a tough life. She's had a severely handicapped child, then adult, who she's looked after and devoted her, devoted her life to. She's been type 2 diabetic for decades. She tried metformin. Guess what? She didn't tolerate it. You'd be surprised. GI side effects. Just worth thinking about that metformin before I move on. In the past, I've investigated, to my shame, a number of people for GI symptoms, for bloating, for diarrhea, for changing bowel habit, only to find, after the normal colonoscopy and gastroscopy, that when I stop their metformin, that their symptoms have got better. I've learned my lesson, and I just want to share it with you in case, hopefully, you might, might too. Anyway, so Mary, type 2 diabetic, four decades, um, she was controlled on glycolyzide. But I got perturbed when a result came in one day. Her HbA1c had gone up to 135. That's huge. And I was really quite alarmed about her becoming quite unwell. So I called her into the surgery and said, what, what's going on, Mary? What's, what's changed? And she admitted that over the last few years, she'd let her diet go a little bit. Um, that she hadn't really been bothered about it. Her son had become more unwell and had actually died. Um, and she'd, she'd taken her eye off the ball, really. So I said to her, I was, I was quite worried that if we didn't do something soon, she might become quite unwell with her sugars running as high as they clearly were. And she said, well, what are the options? And I said, well, the options are we can talk about another oral medication. We could think about insulin. Um, she was not keen on either, not surprisingly. Um, at 84, she had a, you know, a fear of, of more and more medications. And these medications are really lifelong medications when we, when we start them. We don't think about that often enough. And she said, were there any other options? And I said, well, interestingly, I said, my good, my good colleague, Dr. Unwin, has had some success with people who have tried reducing the carbohydrates in their diet. I thought we might buy at least a few weeks headspace really. I didn't expect that to make quite a big difference. But she was up for it and she said she'd, she'd rather give that a go than think about insulin or more medication. And I said, well, as long as we follow your sugars up and as long as they improve, then let, let's give it a go. So off she went and she came back a few weeks later having had her HbA1c checked again. And we checked it again several times over a period of months. This is a graph of her results. Okay. You can see that at the very top here, she spikes at an HbA1c of 135. Within a matter of a few months, it's down to 48. Okay, that's an astonishing drop in HbA1c. I suspect many of you may not have seen a drop that big on purely lifestyle intervention alone. And this wasn't a woman who was swigging six bottles of Coke a day. Not only that, she's lost 11 kilos in weight. She looks great. She's come off her glycoside. So the actual drop in HbA1c is, is probably even better because we've actually taken her off her medication. Most pleasing for me is she feels transformed. She feels positive. She feels upbeat about her future. And she feels for the first time in decades that she is in control of her diabetes. And she knows that if she carries on cutting out the sugar, and in particular the starchy carbs, that she can carry on being in control of her diabetes. So she's an astonishing lady and she's, she's, she's taught me a lot. Don't freak out about this. This isn't a, it's not as scary as you, you think. This is just a graph of another patient, type two diabetic, controlled on insulin for years, a butcher. 
And this is really, he decided to go low carb um, towards the end of each of these graphs. So just very quickly, we can see top left, this is his weight. His weight is the lightest for, well, since 1994. Top right, his diabetes is the best controlled it's been since 2009. His blood pressure, bottom right, is the lowest it's been since 1991. Like Mary, he feels tremendous. He feels empowered. He feels excited about being in control of his disease. Most importantly for this man, on top of his fantastic results, is his chap has come off insulin. Okay? So he's no longer needing any insulin, but still has the best results he's had in many, many years. So we're going to talk now uh, back to sugar. So I think we'd all agree that sugar isn't a great thing to have in your diet with type 2 diabetes, and I was taught that at, uh, at medical school. What I had failed to, to notice was what the glycemic index teaches us. The first thing I noticed was that the glycemic index of brown bread is worse than the glycemic index of table sugar. That really made me think. And so I determined that I would really learn about the glycemic index properly and see how it could help us realize where sugar is coming from. Because the glycemic index predicts really what's going to happen to your blood glucose over two hours after a, after a meal. The problem I discovered with the glycemic index was a lot of health professionals don't really understand it. I, I tried it out on all the staff in the practice trying to explain to them the glycemic index. And they said, please go away, David, and come back with something we can actually understand. We don't get what you're on about. And I was annoyed at the time, but I'm very grateful now because it caused me to think, how would we communicate the glycemic index to patients? And so I, uh, I found one of the original uh, scientists who came up with the glycemic index, Jeffrey Leavesey, and uh, he and I did all the calculations again and reworked the glycemic index in <coughs> terms of teaspoons of sugar so that I can now share with you the equivalent in terms of teaspoons of sugar of all sorts of dietary carbohydrates. And this for patients is, is most interesting. So if we, we look here, if you, if you took 30 grams of cocoa pops there, has a glycemic index of 77. But what does that mean to a patient? Nothing at all. But if I tell you that a, glyce the, uh, a 30 gram serving of cocoa pops affects your blood glucose to the same extent as 7.3 teaspoons of sugar, it becomes obvious that cocoa pops are an appalling choice for somebody with type 2 diabetes. But what, look at this, porridge. I was sure porridge was a brilliant thing for people with diabetes. I used to say, well, it's absorbed over a long time and so on. But actually, again, that's a small helping of porridge. And it affects your blood glucose to the same extent as 4.4 teaspoons of sugar. So some of these starchy breakfasts are not looking great in terms of the best way to start the day. And most people with type, type, type 2 diabetes begin the day as you know, with a higher blood glucose anyway, because it built up overnight. So that then, to straight away start having cocoa pops or even porridge may not be a great idea. What about bread? Yeah, particularly wholemeal bread or brown bread. I thought, I was sure that brown bread was a good thing. But look, here, brown bread, a small slice, a 30 gram slice is very small. So a single slice of brown bread affects your blood glucose to exactly the same extent as 3.3 teaspoons of sugar. So we're beginning to see that many, many people now are having cereals for breakfast. They would then have perhaps brown bread sandwiches for lunch. And what they've actually done, they've had sugar with their sugar with their sugar. And if you went on and had pizza or chips, you've just had sugar all day long. And this is new for me, it was very new and very interesting, and it made me think about how we would communicate with patients the choices that they might make and the consequences. But even in our own lives, we, I didn't really realize that this is what I was doing. 
So this is just something to contrast um, a low-carb breakfast with uh, a conventional breakfast. So if we, we, um, if we took their cornflakes, milk, brown toast, and uh, a small thing of apple juice, that would be regarded by most of us as a healthy breakfast. But look at that. You would have had a total of 21 teaspoon equivalents for your breakfast. You need more than metformin if you're a diabetic to deal with that. It's a terrible way to start the day. Now here's an interesting thing. Um, I actually have type 2 diabetes and uh, so wonderful opportunity, the Freestyle Libra which you will all know about. So I was one of the first to get one. I couldn't wait to see whether my predictions were true for myself. So you're watching me here go through several days here and then here and then that is what happens if I have bran flakes and a glass of apple juice. So it doubled my blood sugar and sent me up to 10.2. A thing that had to happen for three days previously. So that's a kind of empirical just to show you that at least for one patient it makes a difference. Now if you look at this entire day here, I, must, I was eating something but you can't tell when I even had a meal. And that's because I was eating low-carb food that has no... So if I eat an omelette, I can have a three-egg omelette. And there will be, you won't know when I've eaten it because the blood sugar, nothing happens at all. Now maybe it's a better idea that I eat a three-egg omelette than I have sandwiches or other things. Why put my blood glucose up? I don't feel well with a blood glucose of 10. I don't concentrate as well. It's not nice. Uh, and this is what patients tell me as well. Uh, so the Freestyle Libra, and no wonder they're spreading, and no wonder they're... Uh, people are buying them because you learn such interesting, interesting things. Now, is this me or you? you. This is our low-carb diet sheet. You don't need to read it. We, we brought loads of copies if, if anybody wants to take one away. It's just to show you that we can get it onto a side of A4. So you don't need to be reading a textbook or anything on this. A side of A4 will convey the, the basic points. So we're getting now, we, we've just shown you individual cases, which, you know, is all very well and good, but will it, can we do it for more than that? So in the practice, we've been using the low-carb approach for five years, and hundreds of patients have taken it up. But of those hundred, we're very lucky because we have a research cohort of people who've consented to have all their data shared, and they, uh, they like it, they get more follow-up. And this is sharing with you the research cohort. It's changing all the time. We've now got 99, but there were 93 when I did this slide for you. And this, I love these um, box and whisker graphs. This is showing before and after what is happening to this population of people with type 2 diabetes. The first thing is the average duration that they've been on the diet, this particular group, is 20.9 months at the moment. And if we look at them before they began, they had an, uh, a median hemoglobin A1C of 63. So their control on average is actually poor. Below 58 would be regarded as quite good. So that their average is poor. And if you, if you look up here, there are people with, there's probably Mary that right up there, but we've others. And so they're, they're skewed towards poor control. But look at them afterwards. So the average comes down, or the median comes down from 63 down to 47. So at 47, well, that's partial remission. So we're achieving partial remission for this half. This half down here have partial remission. So that for the, for the group, as we followed them up, the results are amazing. Really, no wonder we're excited. We've never seen anything like this uh, before. The next slide. The next question is, well, maybe this is the, the Dr. Robin and Dr. Tobin show. Maybe nobody else can do this. So we now have, uh, we have a, a Google group, and we've got 300 doctors uh, across the country doing this. And this is uh, some people from Wokingham, and this is their first cohort. And what's interesting is their results almost exactly are the same as ours. So when you have something 
that rolls out, something that can be done and reproduced, maybe has more value because other doctors and nurses and dietitians are doing this and getting good results. The ultimate test, really, of the rolling out was um, going back. You remember that I was investigated by diabetes.co.uk. Well, we ended up that meeting as the best of friends because we discovered we'd got shared goals about changing the world of type 2 diabetes. And so uh, they were thinking of doing an online low-carb program, but they didn't really have any clinicians, obviously. And so I helped them with that and we developed the low-carb program. And I was amazed because in the first year, as I've said, a quarter of a million people did that. That's how interested people are. I didn't used to think people were very interested in diet, in helping themselves. I think it was my approach that was wrong because I assumed they weren't capable of it. And so does it roll out? Well, we have rolled it out to a quarter of a million. It does roll out, and the results, uh, it's out to peer review at the moment. Um, we are publishing the results, of course. Uh, a flaw is that it's self-reported data. Maybe these patients that tell us they're doing so well are all showing off. Maybe they're not telling the truth. Uh, but when you deal with a quarter of a million people, um, you would hope that at least some of them are telling the truth. So it's intensely interesting, uh, this whole thing. Next slide. Okay, so some of you might know that, that part of the way GPs are paid is a sort of performance-related pay called QOF, Quality and Outcomes Framework. And so there are performance targets to do with control of people with diabetes. This really slightly complicated graph is, is actually pretty simple. My practice is, is, in, is the blue line here, and we're looking at the percent of patients whose HbA1c is at target, i.e. below 59. You can see uh, five years ago, 2013, we were well below the average. We are now consistently not only above the average within our CCG, within Southport and Formby, but it, we substantially um, beat the average across the whole of the Northwest as well. Um, now, that's not just with a, a low carb approach, on top of that is the fact that we're prescribing less. Um, and we've made huge improvements in, in reducing the amount of medications we prescribe for diabetes. So we began to wonder, well, what impact might that have on our prescribing data, and particularly the costs, because prescribing for diabetes is phenomenally expensive. So as you'd expect, there's a huge difference between our drug prescribing for diabetes and other practices in the CCG. So this is my practice in the red at the bottom, a, a slight increase over the last five years. This is the CCG average in the blue line here, which is kind of taking off exponentially. And that's kind of how it's going nationally. We did some work with the team at Oxford University. They estimated that for a practice equivalent to ours, nine and a half thousand patients, um, we probably save um, 38,000 pounds a year year on year on year in diabetes drug spend alone and that's growing each year that we that we're doing this if you think of the the impact that that will have made on our drug prescribing over the five years we've been doing the low carb stuff if you imagine that that's growing if we roll that out just across our ccg that's an astonishing amount of money to save by allowing people to make the decision between lifelong medication and changing their lifestyle to a lower carbohydrate approach so it has real financial implications as well. So back to another, back to another patient. We're introduced. This is Chris, and uh, Simon and I wrote this case up some years ago. Uh, Chris illustrates so many of the points we've made, really. So Chris uh, was a very overweight type two diabetic, but he had many other things that people with type two diabetes had. Uh, have. So he had high blood pressure. He also had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So his, his liver function was appalling. And of course he was on a whole load of drugs because he, it's obvious that we ought to give lots of drugs for all these things, didn't we? It's hypertension and um, his, also his lipids were very poor. So he had all these things and he was on all these drugs. And the marvellous thing is 
uh, that he has lost so much weight and he's now off all the drugs, everything. He's taken total control over his life. The difference it's made is massive. And typically, the, the biggest difference is he doesn't need to find a toilet all the time. So he, again, met Foreman, gave him loose motions, but he never told me because I never asked, and it's embarrassing. And he had a job driving, so for him, uh, the, the, the loose motions he had with met Foreman was really very serious. And embarrassingly, just like as Simon told you, of course, I, um, you know, he, he did mention it to a, a doctor who investigated him, but metformin was never talked about, and I didn't really know that metformin caused loose motions. So this guy now, he weighs the, late, the least of his adult life. He's joined a gym, he has a totally different life. And he's done it by giving up sugar and, and starchy carbs. He loved bread, he was quite a bread addict. So when he came to me, he said, well, I've, I've, I've given up sugar, so there isn't much else you can do. Uh, but we, I said to him, what's your breakfast? Well, it was about four slices of toast. And he ate a lot of bread, a lot of bread. And he actually now says, when he looks back, he was addicted to carbs because it was a struggle. But when he compares how he feels now, uh, and he's done this for years, there's no competition. He's totally a new man. And this is what we're seeing. And this is what we know so many of us could be seeing, people like Chris, who it's not, it's not some sort of a miracle that I have done. Chris has done this. He now has the model that he's in charge of his life. He's in charge of himself. And that's a wonderfully empowering thing. And he's now teaching other patients. He's become a patient expert. And he'll tell anybody that he can, try and help people understand. This is another patient. This isn't uh, Chris. This is a 70-year-old. Uh, and again, he's got his diabetes into remission here. Typically a sort of quite a sudden drop there. Again, this patient, this 70-year-old, is the lightest he's been for 25 years. These are not things GPs see very often. People becoming the lightest for 25 years. I think I've got now over 100 patients that are the lightest now that they've been since the year 2000. I never thought that was possible. Some other things, though. I wonder what you say to patients with a high triglyceride. Do you know, I didn't really know what to tell people with a high triglyceride, because you know the statins won't make a lot of difference. You know, it's vaguely important. I just used to fudge it. I used to say, well, you need to, uh, well, look at your cholesterol. We need to be looking at the cholesterol. Triglyceride, you know, it goes up and down a lot. I was fudging it. Triglyceride is important. And actually, it reflects carbohydrate metabolism. Because excess glucose, if you, any extra sugar that you don't use for running around, there's really not many things can happen to that extra sugar. It gets pushed by insulin into your belly fat and into your liver cells, where it's turned into triglyceride. That's where triglyceride comes from. And I've done hundreds of patients, and the triglyceride drops. And there we are, this patient's triglyceride is now the best for 10 years. HDL, well, I believe, we have a cardiologist over there, I believe that HDL is important. What I also discover is this fascinating inverse relationship. As the triglyceride drops, the triglyceride, in the HDL goes up. That's a really good thing to have done for cardiovascular risk. And also the blood pressures come down as well. So this intervention isn't just about giving up metformin or improving diabetes. Maybe it, uh, maybe it does other things as well that are worth, worth thinking about. We come now um, to where the cohort is up to in terms of our, of our results. So. If we look here, the hemoglobin A1c, a bit as I shared in the box and whisker, at this, it's changing, it's a dynamic thing. At this point, the average loss, the average improvement in hemoglobin A1c was 20 millimoles per mole. That's the average. Now then, these people, on the whole, are having rather more fat in their diet because they have full fat yogurt, they have full fat milk, they're having cheese. The cholesterol, to my surprise, drops 
significantly. That is a significant result. The HDL, this loss as a minus figure is because the HDL goes up. So the HDL improves also on a higher fat diet. The cholesterol ratio improves and triglycerides improve by about a third on average. If we had a drug that improved triglyceride by a third, we'd make a great deal of money. The weight loss, uh, about nine kilos. At the moment, they're losing 9.7. And again, this is over 22 months. So it's not a short thing, it's not a few months. They're sustaining these weight losses um, for years in many cases. Systolic blood pressure dropping significantly. Diastolic blood pressure dropping significantly. And remember that so many of our patients are coming off the perindopril. I particularly hate amlodipine. I really hate, am amlodipine gives ankle swelling. So young doctors, please, please, ankle swelling on amlodipine, don't add in a diuretic, because it's the amlodipine. Again, I've stopped so much amlodipine. And despite all the deprescribing of amlodipine, perindopril, loads of drugs, the average blood pressures are improving. Final one there is, is gamma GT. In the early days, I couldn't work out what was happening. I could predict which patients were doing well by their improvements in liver function. This is about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So 20% of the developed world has non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I didn't even know what it was. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Anyway, it's 20%. It's double, uh, double the number of people with diabetes. And actually, it is, in its way, a prodrome for diabetes. Prof. Roy Taylor of Newcastle University talks about the long, silent scream from the liver of about 10 years before you be develop type 2 diabetes. Interestingly, many of you will have heard of the Framingham study. The Framingham study actually shows us that improvements in gamma GT are far better uh, predictors of improving risk than uh, changes in cholesterol. So those are the results for the, for the cohort, even with all this deprescribing. So we're coming to the end, uh, the end now. So what, what are the sort of summary points? One of the most important ones for me is I realize I was starting drugs on my patients without asking ever how the patient felt about it. We're starting lifelong medication. We're not honest with our patients. We don't say, you know, this is a start and then I'll add that and that and that. If, if you ask patients, uh, this is going to require lifelong medication, do you want to try a lifestyle thing and I'll support you, or shall we start the drugs? Not one patient in five years, not a single patient in five years has asked me for those drugs. And ours is an ordinary practice. It is not something amazing. Many patients, if given the choice, would prefer. They will try. They will. In enormous numbers, they, they will try. The other thing I would say is all of us mention sugar, but I don't think we mention the effect of starchy carbohydrates. I wasn't doing and again, patients, they get that really fast. We give all we do, we've got our, our single page diet sheet. We give them that, then we ask them to think about it. Are they interested? And if they're interested, they come back and ask questions. It's only a, a small diet sheet, but they absolutely get it. And the old people tell me, oh yes, we used to call it sugar diabetes, Dr. Unwin. And we did. We've forgotten, it used to be sugar diabetes. Now we've called it type 2 and sort of forgotten that it's anything to do with, with sugar. So it's a sort of plea from the heart, really. Uh, Simon and I, we've had such a wonderful time. I honestly was going to retire five years ago. I was utterly fed up with medicine. <coughs> Every day I see patients, and Simon is seeing patients, who are putting their diabetes into remission. I never saw that. Those people are so excited. They come in every day. Yesterday I saw two who come in to shake my hand. So humbling and so amazing and such great medicine that I think I'd love it if more of you were to do this as well. So thank you so much. Just the last slide. Uh, we have published some of our research there and those are the peer-reviewed peer papers we've written. So thank you so much. We've been a bit nervous, but thank you very, very much. Thank you.
we, 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 we've hopefully left plenty of time for questions. Um, we'll do our very best. Feel free to, to ask anything you want. I've applied this to diabetes. Do you think you can apply this to the whole obesity epidemic as well in terms of low carbohydrate diets? Yes, I do. So again, um, I've watched the population that I care for. I've looked after the, the same population for 31 years. I have seen what has happened to the people I care for. The obesity epidemic is so serious, so serious. The young mothers now are enormous, they're huge. I have children cannot run because their thighs are too fat. And we must, we must do something. Only this week, Cancer Research UK have pointed out that the, com the, the, the second commonest thing we could do to prevent cancer is sort out obesity. Obesity causes 13 separate cancers. I have particularly noticed an increase in colorectal and breast cancer in the 30 years I've been practicing. And I think if there's anything we can do about obesity, we really must. I do not believe that drugs or bariatric surgery can be the answer to what I've seen happening in my population. And we really must try, we must try. People are coming to the most dreadful harm. There are two shops now in Southport selling Mobesity scooters. Two shops. When I first got there, there was, you know, it was never heard of. But now we have lots of patients who are too heavy to walk. And the surgeries are full of people on sticks. It's, the waiting room looks completely different. The people are so much heavier and they're younger. And what, another worrying thing is how the people, there were no young type 2 diabetics in the practice when I started. There was nobody under 55, not one. We have hundreds now. We must do something. We must. Thank you. Scott. David Simon, thanks. Um, as you know, David, you've been a big influence in me, just as Rod Taylor's been an influence in you. What do you want to tell the guys about uh, Rod Taylor and Mike Lean's study from Newcastle and Glasgow, the direct study that was published about low calorie, um, sponsored by Diabetes UK, and yeah. the proportion of carbs in that a shake that yeah. they got and the general thoughts on that. Yes, yeah, so, so Roy Taylor of Newcastle, he's my hero. He got me published at the beginning. He believed in me and he, I, I'd never come across the, this amazing guy who did all my stats and said, I, you know, he got me published. But he's done a, a wonderful thing for the world of diabetes recently. He's getting out there the idea that we should aspire to getting diabetes into remission. And he's done this with his amazing study. Now, he would say that he isn't low carb. The way he's done it is by getting patients on a diet which is 800 calories a, a day. When you look at the 800 calories though, it is of course low carb. It is low carb. Because you can't be high carb on 800 calories a day. You really can't. And when we've, we've, we've actually asked him about what sort of a diet the patients go on after they've done the 800, and he does not advise they eat bread or have rice or they're eating pasta. So um, he doesn't come out and say he's low carb, but actually they are using low carb there. The, uh, the 800 calorie diet, of course, is done on sachets, which is not really a great way to live. And what's interesting is the work we've done at Norwood, we're getting not dissimilar results to Roy Taylor and our patients are not restricted. I don't tell them uh, to weigh food or calorie count in any way. And we're getting a lot of uh, patients reversing their diabetes, not dissimilar to Roy, but of course he's doing it on enormous numbers of patients and he has a budget of one point one and a half million pounds and we had 7,000, so there are differences between us. But I'm very grateful to Roy that we should all think about diabetes and remission. It's perfectly possible for most patients. David, can I just a quick question about your, the population that you cater to. Yeah. Is that, um, I mean, what kind of population does Norwood Okay, so, um, so we, we, we are about 9,500 patients, fairly typical, that's just kind of average size general practice. We're in the middle of family land in Southport. Um, 
rel slightly lower, or significantly lower levels of deprivation than you probably have here. Um, but standard, standard seaside town population, really. We're, we're, we're nothing different. We, we have a sort of mix of patients. Just an update. Yes, it has been said before that the low-carb diet is a sort of wealthy person's diet, and it'll never work in a poorer area. So I've challenged this recently. The, the BBC came to me and said, um, will your approach roll out to a poor practice? So we actually found one of the poorest practices in Merseyside, in Kirby. And in April, if you watch the television, there's a program going to be an hour-long um, documentary on BBC One called The Truth About Carbs. And I hope on that program you'll see that I can roll it out to Kirby. And the people there did it. But they understood you don't have to eat bread, you can eat other things. So it is something we, we're thinking about. But we have... Uh, What's interesting is, actually, we ask the patients, is it more expensive? And this, they say, if we're being honest, it isn't, because before I was spending a fortune on snacks and sugary drinks. And if, you, if you're truthful about what you're spending your money on, they said it wasn't just the money in the supermarket, because every time you buy petrol, every time, they were spending a lot of money on sugary drinks and snacks, and that it works out approximately the same is what the housewives tell us. The reason I ask is because we cater to a lot of um, South Asians, yeah. um, North Africans, mm -hmm. and Liverpool as well. So there's a lot of cultural yes. variation as well in the uptake. Have yeah. you experienced that? In yeah. What's interesting is I mentioned the. This is my pen, isn't it? Yeah. I mentioned the Google group that we that we have. And of course, we, we have GPs in that that cater for the Asian community. You saw there is Vipan's results yeah. there. Well, that's one. But it turns out there's a, another GP called Kesar who's actually been doing low carb for his Asian community for 10 years. And he's taught them to make chapatis with gram fire and other things. So it needs tailoring to the Asian. But their, their need is particularly great, as you know. And um, uh, there's there's international interest in this now because there are countries that cannot afford the drug bill for diabetes um, and so they're having to look at there must be an alternative and of course this isn't a genetic thing is it it can't be so my population 30 years ago they can't have changed in 30 years to become all diabetic so something has changed all our grandparents were not diabetic so across the world we must be able to reverse this. It must be a dietary thing. And we all perhaps need to get nearer to the way we ate 40 or 50 years ago in each country. And that helps maybe steer us to how we might do research. Hi there. Can you explain exactly this kind of thing you say to your patients with regards to advice with low keto diets? Because obviously, I guess the worry is for some people about the increase in aspartame and sweetener intake they might do. Yeah. Or the other side is obviously processed meats and red meats, which yeah. show an increased risk in colon cancer yeah. um, in the future. So you guys not a bit worried about the fact that maybe these patients are then trading in their diabetes for potentially other future risks such as colon cancer? So I'll tell you how I do it. I would say to somebody with type 2 diabetes, I say, well, your hemoglobin A1C is high. This is a reflection of how much sugar you've had over the previous few months. Where do you think that sugar has come from? Because asking questions is always more powerful than telling people things. And then I learn stuff. Now, some of my patients are having three teaspoons of sugar in every coffee and tea all day long. So that's low-hanging fruit for them. Others are mystified, and they say, well, I've cut out sugar. But it turns out they're having um, a lot of mashed potato, or they're having a lot of chips. I would say, turn the white stuff on your plate green. So our thing is, why on earth don't have a curry, enjoy a curry. Put your curry on top of green vegetables. It's really, that's how, don't have, so I say to people, don't have tiny meals. I'm personally annoyed if my wife gives me a tiny meal. I want a big meal. So turn the white stuff green. So my patients are actually having far more green vegetables. The other things are similar. I'd say they're having more eggs, probably. They're having more yogurt. 
But I think given that sort of advice, I do not believe I'm doing anything at all wrong because it's, it's the green veg that they increase. And they, we run a group that meets every two months talking about recipes and we, have, we do cooking together and all sorts. And it's the veg that they learn how to cook veg. Thank you. Quite impressive, well, very impressive results in the uh, outpatient setting. Um, from on the, as inpatients on the diabetes ward, I was just wondering, in regards, so we give a lot of um, drugs out, kind of low, trying to lower um, BMs and, and lower the HbA1c. Do you think that there's any role for, we can have a higher degree of control in the inpatient setting, but whether we should kind of be prescribing l kind of low carb diets for our patients who often are there for quite some time so they can see the health benefits? You've got a wonderful opportunity there that I do not have because they're safe and you're measuring things. There are at least two inpatient units in America doing this, maybe three, um, because they've joined my, uh, my Google group and they're doing amazing stuff by getting type 2 diabetics off insulin in weeks on an inpatient thing. So there is an opportunity there. There's certainly an opportunity for talking about sugar with anybody. The only thing is I despair to see the chocolate machines. So for somebody like me with type 2 diabetes, I could starve to death in a hospital. I really could. There is so little for me to eat. If I go into the shop, where are, where are the almonds? Where are the walnuts? Why are we allowing the hospitals to sell chocolate and sweet stuff? I think it's really wrong. But the hospitals, there's an opportunity there, and other uh, healthcare professionals around the world are taking that opportunity and getting some better results than I can do. So if I can do that in primary care, you should beat me. There's a challenge. <laughs> Can I just add a quick note on the inpatient bit? I think it de also depends largely on the phase of the admission or, uh, yes, and the yes. illness, really. So we can't sort of generalize the low-carb aspect yeah. uh, to any admission. It has to be very, very specific if they have to be rolled out. Hi. Um, this is undoubtedly a paradigm shift. I was wondering what reception and influence you're having on medical schools. Oh, right. Well, <coughs> there's news on that front as well. There's, there's, uh, there's news. So um, the Royal College of General Practitioners has asked me to write an e-learning module for the Royal College of uh, General Practitioners, which will come out, I think, in May. And that will be available to 52,000 GPs right across the country. The Royal Colleges are really having a problem with multiple morbidity all of the Royal Colleges. And the only answer to multiple morbidity, these people with obesity, heart disease, liver disease, is to put the patient center to the consultation. And so I am champion for collaboration with obesity and diabetes for the Royal College. And that's because we're beginning to think about involving patients. That's right from the top in NICE. So all the NICE guidelines now, right from the very top, um, thinking about collaborating with patients and asking them how do they feel about medication. So there is a paradigm uh, shift coming, there really is. Anything, Anything in medical schools? That's medical question. schools, it was, that was the question, wasn't it? I don't know of anything in medical schools because I've concentrated on the Royal College. Do you? No, no I'm no. not, but, but it should. The, the NICE guidelines would help them because everybody worries so much about guidelines now. And this collaboration thing, that's the, that's the way in, I, I think, yeah. So maybe down. Did you want to ask a Good. Um, when somebody's switching to a low-carb diet, do you find like in the first month they need like a lot more extra support because of the sugar cravings, yeah. switching from carbs? This, this is really interesting. It varies. I have a group of people that vanish and come back having lost about four stone. Often men, they're amazing. They just get it and say, right, I'll do it. And others, uh, so uh, my wife and I did this differently. I, was at a, a, I sort of tiptoed into it and did it gradually and messed about for about a year, and my wife just did it. But the people that tiptoe into it, like me, um, yes, they would require a bit more support. And for them, I might be seeing them on a monthly basis. 
I might be seeing them on a monthly basis. But it's only a, a small proportion that, that want that. Many of them just get it. Or, of course, they could just join on the low-carb. Uh, so the, the, the low-carb program is a 10-week program, giving them half a video half an hour a week. So a quarter of a million people have, have, have done that. It's all, it's all to do with your sugar journey. So it's talking to the patient to say, where are you with sugar now? So again, it may be that you just, they start by giving up sugar and then bread. For every patient, it's different. Some of them, are, an interesting practical point is, um, I wasn't aware about the inverse relationship between insulin and sodium. So insulin retains sodium at the, at the kidneys. So people on a low carb diet have a diuresis and we out quite a lot of sodium, which is perhaps how the blood pressure improves. But people on a low-carb diet need to take in quite a lot more salt or you get muscle cramps. I'm a runner, and if I don't have extra salt on my green veg, I will get cramps. And it's because of this fascinating link between insulin and sodium and blood pressure. So I have quite a low blood pressure now. I will often feel faint if I stand up too quickly. And that's the other thing to warn patients because their blood pressure improves, if you start feeling dizzy when you stand up, maybe your perindopril needs chopping in half. And that's how we've done so much deprescribing. So there are quite a few practical things. And that's what I'm putting in my uh, learning profile for doctors. I also have a full learning pack if anybody wants to know more. If you email me at unwin5 at btinternet.com, I've done a special healthcare professional pack to try and point out where you would find more information and get more information. So that's unwin5, U-N-W-I-N, unwin5, the numeral 5, at btinternet.com. And I'd answer any questions or help anybody. I don't think that the other thing just to mention there is I've learned that I've, I have to be really cautious with the type 2s on insulin. A couple of times, uh, patients of mine have gone at the low carb hammer and tongs and had hypos. And it's because I haven't been brave enough with reducing their insulin more substantially at the, the outset. Preferably for me, I do it more gradually now and try and, and, and avoid them saying, and, that some, and some of them, it's often the male patients, as David said, are, are wanting to throw themselves into it. Um, uh, I, it's much better if you can tiptoe into it gradually with smaller reductions in insulin, but you do have to reduce the insulin often quite significantly. Perversely, what often happens is people have hypos because they're eating fewer carbs, and then what they do, they start back on the carbs. And that's just bonkers, because you need to be reducing the insulin, and it's a real opportunity then to reduce the insulin, rather than, you, you don't treat a hypo with carbs, you treat a hypo with reducing the insulin. David, I want to second your point on insulin effect because we, on my journey in this, I found that insulin stimulates HMG. Thank you very much. It was an excellent presentation Thank you. Thank uh, you. and your passion for it comes across and I hope you get the feeling that we're equally passionate about this uh, change in approach to type 2 diabetes. I don't want to pry David but if I saw you in the clinic with symptomatic type 2 diabetes I'd be worried you'd be at the beta cell failure end of that mm -hmm. spectrum of conditions yeah. and my advice would be that you're probably going to need insulin sooner rather than later. So have you had any um, 
experience or success in offering the same low carb advice to lean type 2 patients? And would you be wary of doing that? So the answer is yes. We, if I, of all the hundreds we've done, of course some of them are, are thinner. And um, one of the worries I'd always say, if you, one of my worries in the early days was if, if, if people are not improving, um, if they're losing weight and your hemoglobin A1C isn't going up, how, have they got CA pancreas or something like that? So that's another thing that I haven't found one yet, but I've worried about people who say, oh, hooray, I'm losing weight, and if the hemoglobin A1C is going up. But I haven't, I haven't, yet, I haven't yet had a problem. I keep waiting for it and being nervous and, and, uh, and, and worrying, but I haven't yet had a problem. What about you, Simon? You've done no. as many as me. No. No, we haven't had it. Can, can I ask as well how much advice you give on activity as well as the dietary changes? Do you give advice on and, activity? Well, 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 yeah, I mean, lots. Um, and it goes hand in hand with the dietary advice. I mean, I'm passionate about increasing people's visit, physical activity, um, doing any forms of, of exercise. We've, my practice has helped set up our local park run. We've got a practice walking group. So there's a lot of that goes on. In terms of the results I see in the diabetics who improve, my hunch is it's the low carb that's doing more than the physical activity. Both count, but just in terms of bang for your buck, I think it's the dietary change brings about most of it. Possibly two thirds if you ask me for a figure um, to a third for physical activity, but both crucially important and go hand in hand as part of the, you know, part of moving forward. If we, if we look at the weight of the cohort, the average person with type 2 diabetes at Norwood Avenue weighs 100 kilos. And they're about 55. So somebody that weighs 100 kilos, age 55, they really struggle to exercise. But what is wonderful is these same people, when they've lost 10 kilos, then they're walking. Then they're, they're doing amazing things. And in fact, it was one of our type 2 diabetics who started our we also have a, a, a walking group in the practice, and it was her idea. She's somebody, when they lose weight, they have energy then. But they, they, the heavy ones are in too much pain, most of them, to exercise. And that's, I think, what caused me to despair, that they would never, you know, you couldn't get them to run or do anything. But you can when they lose weight. We do both. And sorry to hog the conversation. We've got some um, uh, people with type 1 diabetes in the audience. Uh, I know it's slightly off topic, but what recommendations would you give for people with type 1 diabetes and low GI, low yeah. carb diet? This is such an interesting area. You may have heard of the wonderful kids in America called type 1 grit. And, and this, this is a group of parents who were concerned about how it was, uh, what actually happened to their children with type 1. And there are thousands of them on a low carb diet in America doing very well on a lower carb approach. Further to that, when we looked at, we've got stats now at diabetes.co.uk, when we looked at the quarter of a million people uh, who've done the program, I think about 40,000 of them were, had type 1 diabetes, a huge number. And so the, the type 1 diabetes group, they're great to work with because they really know their blood sugars, they monitor them, and so actually the, there may be something there, and it's something I'm thinking about, but I'm nervous. I'm nervous, uh, but anecdotally, I know of a lot of people with type 1 diabetes who have reduced their insulin usage significantly, and also they don't have as many hypos. Because if you have carbs, you're jumping around and following with insulin all the time. If your diet has fewer carbs in it, uh, the, the, it jumps about a lot less. Mm -hmm. And there's a wonderful GP called Ian Lake who has type 1 diabetes, and he's doing a lot of work trying to promote a lower carb approach for type 1. But it's at an earlier stage. To just take up on, on that, Ian Lake now thinks he has type 2 diabetes as well as a result of the very high insulin levels that he's needed in the past to control his high carbohydrate intake you know, recommended to him decades gone by for his type 1 diabetes. So he's desperate to do something for the type 1 diabetics around this. I, I see a lot of people on insulin pumps, and we've got some who've embraced... I'm always a bit wary of them going completely carb-free, and the temptation a lot of uh, 
uh, of type one patients have, because as you say, they're usually uh, uh, well read and, and look into this <coughs> a lot. Uh, if they become completely carb free, they become ketotic, which I have concerns about. Mm. But we've had some who've reduced their carbs to a safe level and don't need to give bolus doses of insulin yeah. anymore. Yeah. They can maintain on a basal insulin and their weight, exactly as you've shown, their weight yeah. comes down, blood pressure drops, lipid profile improves. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, again, we're getting ahead around type 2 diabetes. We will be doing it with type yeah. 1 diabetes. I think so as well. Yeah. Thank you very much. Can I? Any, anyone else? Yeah. Oh. I just wanted to ask about, um, you know, with the low carb diet, we have a lot of patients who don't actually have any vegetables in their diet. So, how do you actually bulk up the plate if we're not having any vegetables or fruits in the normal yeah. diet? I, well, I, I think it comes very much down to, to choice. I'm, I'm, neither of us is keen on telling people anything. And we don't see ourselves as, as, as banging a drum or, or saying people that your diet must be like this. You must eat green veg. We talk about options. We talk about goals and hopes for the future. We talk about what do you want from your, your health, from your life. You know, what do you want from your diabetes? What are your thoughts about the risk of complications in the future? What are your thoughts about medication? Because you have some choices. And those choices may be tablets or dietary change, possibly both. You need fewer tablets and possibly no tablets if you did embrace dietary change. But that's your choice. I, I don't mind. I think it, my, my job is to be open to people about the choices and to empower them to make informed decisions. And if they say, and I do have people say, I don't like veg, I can't eat veg. Well, that, that's okay, that's a choice. I'm, I'm comfortable with that and I let them choose. It's disappointing, but people make their own decisions. The other thing is um, I find the iPhones are very useful. I get them to photograph what they eat. And then the choice, they, we come back to choice, but at least it's information relevant to those choices. So that I would point out that that enormous bowl of cornflakes, you know, that's about 16 teaspoons of sugar you've got there. Are you sure that's what you're going to have for your breakfast or would you, why don't you have three eggs? So that um, I, the choice it comes with information and then they just make the choice, really. And, to be honest, if, if it's just the same as a sugar addict that wants to carry on having sugar, I'm not sure I can help you that much. And insulin will not be an answer. It's a bit hard, but that's the truth of it, isn't it, really? Um, so, uh, but it's amazing the patients, once they, you have, to want, you have to want a better future to make some difficult choices. So for me, it's how can I, mot I'm very interested in, in motivating people so I talk about, the more you, so if you, if you weigh 100 kilos, it never occurs to you what would life be like at 88 kilos. But if you ask them, if you weighed less, you know, how would that be? What would your life be like? And then they say, well, you know, particularly women talk about the clothes they'd like to wear. Or, you know, they begin to imagine being able to breathe better. What would that be like? When they imagine a better life, that's very motivating. And all of a sudden, your cornflakes, you're prepared to give them up. And so I put a lot more work into discussing a patient's preferred future and what that would be like and how would they be and what would it be like if you could play. So I asked them, what would you like to do? Loads of them say, well, a problem with my weight is I can't play with my children. It's embarrassing being fat. And I say, well, what would you do if you didn't weigh this? And they, they start describing that. And the more they describe a better future, the more they are likely to do it. My wife is a consultant health psychologist, and she's taught me how we motivate patients. And I think that's really, before we start giving information and advice, we have a lot to learn about um, motivation of our patients. And I think I'm getting better at that, perhaps. I think, it, I think it's this, this thought of a, what they call a preferred future, about a dream. And I think as healthcare professionals, we can sell that. We can sell the dream, and it sounds a bit Disney fiber. You know, this could be you. You could be 20 kilos lighter. I've seen it. I had somebody come and see me yesterday who lost that amount of weight, and you could be that person if you made some choices. But that's your that's your shout. It's your decision. I'm going to f finish with one last question. 
So Verta Health came out with their results earlier in the year um, on a very similar results to yours, but on a slightly larger scale. Yeah. Apart from the low carb program that they embarked on, there were five other elements as well in terms of uh, health psychology, in terms of close contact. Now, if we were to enroll this concept out on a larger scale from a CCG point of view, you think that would be applicable? Will that be needed? So, so Verta Health, uh, you can now, I think, pay 4000 Is it $4,000? It's quite a lot of money. So you can pay in America what I do for free. Uh, you know, you could pay $4,000. And the results are quite similar to the ones that Simon and I um, get. I think uh, the thing we've just touched upon, certainly the, the motivation of patients is very important. And as part of that, I'd say, if I was doing a, rolling out a program, I think feedback for patients is really important. So the EMIS computer systems in general practice generate these marvelous graphs. I do hundreds and hundreds of those graphs, as Simon knows. And patients love their graphs. So I would say a sensitivity to the psychological aspects of this motivation, feedback, behavior change is what would mitigate to success. Um, and you'd add that into the low carb, bringing in exercise as well for the, when they've lost some weight. So for me, it's, the psychology is really important, low carb and exercise, but a bit later for the ones that are very heavy is my answer. Yeah. Yes. yes, so diabetes.co.uk do it, or Diet Doctor is cheaper still. I think he's about 30 pounds, 30 pounds a month, and Jason Fung in Canada does it for $700. So it's been done all over the world, but mainly charged for. Well, on that note, thank you very much. Thank you thank so you. much.